Hello, welcome back everybody. Our next panel is about bank regulatory pressures. I'm going to pass over now to our panel to introduce themselves and the topic. Thank you. Thank you, Molly. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Fadi Massey. I'm an uh, Associate Managing Director at Moody's Ratings and uh, I manage the team responsible for the ratings of uh, global investment banks and capital markets firms. Uh, I've been doing this for 11 years. And I'm very delighted to be moderating this panel on SRTs. So um, I think it's a important and evolving uh, market that has been mentioned at least a couple of times in each of the previous uh, panels today. Um, it does sit at uh, the intersection of three important themes that have been happening over the past few years. Um, the first of which is bank regulation and the tightening on that front. Um, and also uh, the, um, the rise in private credit and the evolution of, of that whole asset class. Uh, and then lastly, the third theme that I think is very important is macroeconomic conditions um, that have been driving the um, uh, collateral or the reference pools and the loans um, on those banks' uh, balance sheets. So with me um, to help shed some light onto that market uh, are uh, Sarah McGinty to my left. Um, Sarah is a managing director in the Aris Credit Group, uh, where she focuses on alternative credit investments. Uh, and prior to joining Aries in 2023, Sarah was the head of partnerships and business development and co-head of capital markets at Theorem Partners. Um, previously, Sarah held numerous senior leadership roles, uh, including head of secured lending syndication at Morgan Stanley and Bear Stearns, where she covered asset managers for corporate credit products. Um, and also to the left, um, uh, Barry Rosenbaum is a director at Seer Capital. She's been there for 10 years. Um, uh, Seer Capital is a credit-focused investment firm. Barry joined the firm uh, 10 years ago, and her responsibilities include trading and analyzing uh, European structured products, such as bank capital relief trades, um, and uh, wholesale business securitizations as well. Um, Barry previously worked at the firm CMBS BP's trading desk. Um, and also to her left, uh, Chip Salter. Uh, Chip is an executive director at Wells Fargo Securities uh, Product Group. Um, overseeing the structured solutions effort, Chip has over 20 years uh, of experience in, uh, in uh, SRTs and CLNs, uh, 13 of which uh, spent in Treasury at Ally, where uh, uh, Chip helped structure um, the CLN uh, platform there, as well as executing on securitization and loan um, uh, loan sales. Uh, Chip also held a number of roles across Bank of America um, and Wachovia. So welcome all. Thank you. Um, I think it's important for us to kick things off with just setting the stage um, on how that market has evolved. So I think, um, Chip, if we can start with you, help us set the stage and uh, the evolution of the drivers uh, that shaped the SRT market. Throughout yeah, the thanks, Fadi. Uh, so, uh, a quick uh, history, you know, obviously there was CRT before the Great Recession, uh, about well, a couple banks, not a lot, uh, executed significantly with the Great Recession and Dodd-Frank uh, really kind of shut down that opportunity in the U.S. Uh, and put it on hold. And so, uh, you know, thankfully last September, uh, the Fed came out with the FAQ. Uh, that really gave clarity uh, to the ability, uh, especially for banks that were wanting to be programmatic. If you're going to go out and set up a program, uh, you want to make sure you're, you're uh, going to receive the benefits you think you are. And, and by the Fed, not only giving clarity for unsecured credit link notes and uh, explicitly also stating for SPE type structures or um, CDS, uh, I think that gave a lot of uh, confidence to banks that now to want to pursue that. Uh, and before that, there was, you know, a couple of banks that were very active in the space uh, that, you know, for various reasons, mergers and, you know, wanting to generate capital that also helped kind of set that stage for a lot of others that could qu quickly hit the ground running uh, once that approvals have happened. And so I think you're, you're seeing a lot of the super regionals uh, and some, some of the small regionals really start to pursue it. Um, you know, the GSIBs obviously are very active. Uh, in the space uh, with sublines, you see a lot of headlines. Uh, but you know, the U.S. Uh, I would say, by and large, most banks are using it uh, to 
be more optimal with their capital efficiency. Uh, whereas in Europe, you know, you're, it, it's been uh, you know 10 plus years, 15 years, uh, where they're executing uh, both capital, but also for you know uh, you know transferring you know, more lo higher loss content assets. Uh, and I think over time, as the U.S. market develops and, and more treasuries and risk management get comfortable uh, with CRT, that you know that could develop here in the U.S. as well. Um, Barry, can you touch on the demand side and what you're seeing on, on that front? Um, yeah, sure. So um, following the Fed FAQ in September of last year, um, there was definitely a wave of issuance that we saw in the U.S. in the fourth quarter. Um, I think the pace hasn't continued to expectations. We've seen some very large deals from large issuers, but the market, I think, has been a little thin in terms of number of deals and number of issuers in the market. Um, as Chip mentions, we've seen some deals from some very large deals from some large U.S. banks, but for regional banks, there's definitely a need for SRT, but it's a little harder for them to get on board. There's a lot of compliance regulatory um, hurdles that they need to get through to um, figure out an SRT program. Um, that, I think, combined with the influx of capital into private credit has caused um, some tightening in spread that we've seen significant since... I guess, for the, over the past year. Um, so I think that's kind of where we are now, but I think the market will develop, more banks will enter the market, and hopefully that will even out. And Sarah, in terms of the asset classes, could you touch on that in terms of the evolution last uh, few, you know, 12, 12 months? Sure. Um, if I think about what we've seen out of the banks in the last kind of 12 to 18 months since the U.S. market has really heated up, I think, you know, only... 12 months ago, uh, we were doing arguably, I think, one of the largest SRT transactions in the market still in the U.S. market to date, which was a um, almost $8 billion uh, reference portfolio of super prime auto loan uh, SRT. Um, so that that will go to show you in 12 months how quickly the market has, uh, has evolved there. That was a kind of privately negotiated one-on-one -on -one negotiation, no, no no uh, ratings, no broadly syndicated anything there, and now you've seen the auto market come um, full circle in SRT, where uh, those processes are now much, much significantly tighter on a spread basis, but also um, very much in the broadly syndicated market. But uh, auto uh, capital calls, we've seen uh, quite a few SRTs there uh, and still seeing uh, more and more um, activity there, investment-grade corporates, um, high-yield corporates, I've seen a little bit in the resi space, uh, and now I think the, the the corporates, the capital calls, and the autos were really where most of the activity was focused. I think now um, that the market is getting a little bit more sophisticated and banks are using the technology they've developed in other, uh, they can see where else they can apply it um, on the bank balance sheet. So you're seeing things like infrastructure trades, um, maybe a little dabbling in CRE, although that's a whole different animal. And then from a bank standpoint, in terms of, you know, strategy, deciding which route to take, whether it's an SRT, whether it's a, a different type of, um, you know, transaction, uh, maybe Sarah, if you, if you could, you know, touch on the decision, the rationale for what you see from your standpoint the bank's doing and how, how, you, how you interpret that. Well, I think it, it comes down to what the bank is, is solving for. So obviously Basel III Endgame has has really been um, the Kickstarter for this. And so even, even now where that regulation has become more clear and, and seemingly less punitive, there's still a, a reasonable amount of capital, um, uh, the ratios that need to be in increased. And so SRT can be a, a good tool for that for, um, for the banks if that really, if they need RWA relief. If they're looking to solve, um, which we are seeing right now, balance sheet issues or capacity issues to be able to serve certain sectors such as you know, digital infrastructure, data centers, things like that, then SRT is probably, it's a tool, but it's not, it's not the tool for, for solving that problem. So um, I think it, it really is, uh, there's a bunch of things in the toolkit to, for banks to optimize, but uh, SRT is there if, if, if RWA relief is something that they need, then, then doing an SRT, whether it's on their capital call book or their auto loan book, um, it's an effective tool. But I think for solving other issues like for growth and, and balance sheet constraints or uh, assets becoming non-core and, and looking to sell those off, uh, you know, that's another way that, that banks can 
solve for capital, but it really depends what their, uh, if this is core assets that they want to hold on balance sheet, then SRT is probably the right tool. Right, so on the regulatory side of things, there was the proposal initially late last year and then the reproposal early this um, in September, the regulatory capital requirement for the eight uh, GSIBs, instead of 19% increase in capital required, it's about 9%. Um, and for the uh, all other banks over 100 billion, it's instead of uh, an increase of 6%, it's an increase of 35 to 4%. Uh, so sticking to the theme of optionality, the tools that are in the toolbox, um, Chip, if you could chime in here and let us know what, what you see in terms of structuring um, other than SRTs. Yeah, and even before uh, SRT, you know, from my perspective, having you know been in the category four and a, a GSIB bank, I think there should be every uh, you know regional, super regional bank should have every tool in the toolkit. So having a securitization program where you diversify your liquidity and the funding, uh, especially when that post Silicon Valley, uh, when you see you know that stress on deposits, as well as the only funding tool that you can have that you can convert to capital if you need to episodically a, a particular quarter. Uh, and then as well as CRT, I know he was referencing, you know, the pressures from Basel III Endgame, but again, going back to the previous, we, we were looking at it long before Basel III Endgame. Uh, when you can generate 4 to 6% cost of capital with essentially free insurance, you know, that's something that just makes too much sense as long as you can redeploy that capital uh, and use it and, and even help build your capital cushion because you, you can, you know, redeploy half of it and then you, you build your cushion uh, capital more. But then, you know, to your uh, question on what, what makes sense for each bank, it really depends on their asset composition and size. Uh, so if they've got consumer assets that are low loss that you can, you know, um, you know, tranche up and syndicate broadly, uh, you know, you're going to execute uh, you know, uh, significantly tighter levels than, you know, if you have to do a bilat. But the reality is that that takes work. If you're going to, uh, you know, prepare to issue to ABS investors or certain, um, you know, loss curves, loss data, investor reporting that has to be put in place. So for some banks, I think it makes a lot more sense, uh, especially if they're kind of testing the waters, you know, do a, a bilat or even a mini club deal. Uh, and again, if it's more assets that are not typically rated and tranched up, I think that's why you see sublines or naturally you're seeing a more bilateral type transactions, even though Goldman's trade last week could change that. We'll be interested to see how that develops uh, by um, rating uh, sublines. But co uh, corporate loans and, and uh, some of the other asset types, uh, you know, I think that, you know, more bilat where you can just work with one investor and, and have a much re uh, lower requirement on reporting uh, will make a, a lot of sense. So, you know, as Sarah said, it really is going to, you know, it's bank by bank what their needs are, looking at liquidity needs versus uh, capital. Uh, but again, you know, I think it, uh, you know, as things uh, continue to move forward, and I think especially, uh, you know, your category, your, your super regional banks and more and more doing it, uh, I think others will say, hey, this, you know, start to get it and, uh, you know, um, start to follow suit. And, and Chip, just to clarify, the uh, Goldman transaction you're referencing, that's the securitization on the sublines that, that happened? Yes, uh, they rated a 475 uh, million pool. Million pool. Um, Barry, from your perspective, um, you know, the in interest from investors, all those uh, demand supply dynamics that we spoke about, um, what do you see are, you know, some of the tailwinds uh, that are coming to, to that market? Um, so you mean like from like investor perspective? Sorry, just to yeah, clarify. yeah. Just um, uh, given the evolution on the regulatory side, that's pushing a lot of the supply. How is the dem demand side of things evolving, and and you know availability of capital there? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's kind of what I touched on a little bit before. You've seen um, definitely an increase of capital into private credit, so I think there has been a lot of demand for SRT deals. I mean, if you read the news or Bloomberg, there's an article about SRT like every other day, maybe every day, so there's definitely a lot of demand there. Um, I mean, we've seen some supply. Um, I just think that it needs to develop into more of a programmatic issuance for banks, and I think that as more banks develop SRT programs and use it, they'll look to different areas of their balance sheet where um, the risk weight of the assets don't match the underlying risk, and they'll look at 
different asset classes. And I think as that evolves over time, I think the market will develop more and I think that there'll be better supply demand. Got it, got it. Um, let's talk a bit about these volumes since we're talking about that. Chip, you mentioned um, you know, the, the US market, um, but also SRT has historically been largely dominated by the European market. Um, just you know, describe what, what, you, what you see from your seed in terms of you know, the US versus more of a global, global footprint. <laughs> Yeah, I think, you know, again, I've been in my seat for 60, 90 days, so just uh, talking to banks. Uh, but uh, the more I talk, what I, we are hearing is that, um, you know, you're going, uh, you know, a lot of the banks are going to have to put the pipes in place and infrastructure. Um, and uh, I think especially, you know, the super regionals, uh, you'll start to see them come more and more as they're evaluating it. Uh, you know, my experience previously as an issuer, I was surprised as well at, uh, before we even did our trade, uh, you know, equity investors caught wind of it and were modeling it out and seeing what a great benefit. And I think, you know, there, there'll be potentially some pressure from equity investors for others that aren't doing it in that super regional. Uh, and again, I should have said at the beginning, this is my opinion, not the opinions of Wells Fargo Securities. <laughs> but, uh, um, and so that is, uh, you know, I think, um, as I said, when you can, you know, generate capital for four to, you know, four to six to seven percent. And by the way, you essentially get free insurance. Uh, because that is, you know, as long as you're redeploying that capital, it pays for itself. And, uh, you know, no one here wants a hard landing, uh, but having been through, through that hard landing, if I had a nickel for every time someone said uh, before the Great Recession, it's a good thing the regulatory capital benefit pays for it because you're never going to collect on that. Uh, and then the Great Recession happened, and, and it did collect. And so that single-digit cost of capital all of a sudden becomes free, or if not positive. And so I think a lot of banks, and, and, and now that regulators are embracing it, one of the, the really nice things about the tool is it really is a perfectly tailored tool for banks from a stress test, like CCAR, uh, or if you're, you're not a Category 4 bank, just a capital stress test, because it allows the banks to retain most of the economics from their assets, but protecting themselves more uh, if there is, you know, some uh, hard landing event in, in the future. Uh, and I think that, you know, is one of the, the benefits of the unsecured credit link note structures. You, you can play with that first loss piece um, and, uh, you know, uh, which, you know, depending on your, your desired cost of capital and your RWAs, uh, really uh, optimize that. Is there a way to quantify, Barry, the U.S. market from what's happening in the US, uh, the European side of things? Um, yeah, I mean, one exercise that we did is just to look at the potential size of the US market. So, um, next slide. So if you look at all banks that are 10 billion plus in the US, there's 129 banks that total around 23 trillion of assets. Um, here you can see them broken down by different sizes. Um, you can see which ones have issued SRT deals. Um, and then I think to see the potential size of the U.S. market, you can look at what has happened in the European market. So um, in Europe, 25 of the top 40 European banks have issued SRT deals, which also I think highlights you know, how it's really viewed as a capital and risk management tool in Europe. But we can, anyways, so you can see on average, they reference, I would say, 1.2 to 3.5% of their total assets in SRT deals. And so if you take those numbers and apply them to the U.S. market, um, you can do different levels of take. And so you get a market size of around 25 to 82 billion. Um, it is important to note that this does not include deals that have already been issued. So you'd probably have to take some of, take that out of the numbers. And also this is all just pent up supply. So once the pens up supply is cleared. I think the U.S. market will give way to regular issuance, which stands at around 20 billion per annum, excluding the U.S. So it's just a way to quantify the market. And uh, in terms of existing issuances, is there a way to think about the size of that? Uh, how big is it, U.S. market? U.S. market right now, I mean, it's hard to say because I think a lot of the deals have been a little more on the private side, um, so they're not as publicly known. So I mean, if I were to take out from this number, I would say maybe take out 15 billion, but again, like that's just an estimate. I'm not 100% sure. It's just definitely not as public of a market and not all the deals are disclosed. 
Right, yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting point. A lot of, uh, you know, private uh, dealt partnerships there. Maybe they have a, a guess also, I don't know, interesting. But yeah, I think Q4 it is a popular time of year for SRT transactions, and I think we have seen or will see, we know it's, we, we know it's coming in the next month or so, probably about 50 billion of reference portfolio across different asset classes, so call that, I don't know, five, six, Seven billion of uh, risk to be to be placed into the market. So, but you know, if that's five, six, seven billion, that is heavy in Q4. So, Q2 was slow. Q1 had a few deals. Q2 was slow. Q3 Q3 picked up, and Q4 is kind of the the big bang in terms of the issuance. So, I don't think your number is that crazy. Um, just a reminder for everyone that we do have uh, Slido uh, up there, so if folks want to ask questions, please use the QR code and, and submit them, and then we'll go through them. Um, earlier this morning, um, I think on one of the panels or even the Spotlight conversation with Joel, um, there was a conversation around, uh, Sarah, the, the bilateral nature of the deals and the partnership. So diving into the partnership theme of what's going on between banks, private credit, um, how does an SRT transaction get negotiated? How, how do they get sourced um, from your seat? And what does a bilateral uh, transaction actually look like compared to the syndicated market? Sure. So, I mean, as it relates to bank partnerships in general, and, and to Joel's point this morning, uh, all of these formats, whether they're SRT or they're uh, you know, privately negotiated solutions for banks to help them solve whatever issues they're having, whether it be with balance sheet capacity or, or, or risk-weighted assets, they're all a form of partnership. These, these trades are, are complex, the, the documentation is complex, they take a long time to execute no matter how programmatic they've become. So, um, you know, getting one of these done with a bank is a form of partnership because the idea is that you will repeat this in the, in the future. Um, but all forms of partnership. I mean, earlier this year, we bought an equipment financing platform out of a regional bank. I think Joel had mentioned that as well. Um, that opportunity, in addition to, you know, buying a bank portfolio of assets in digital infrastructure because the bank has to free up capacity to deal with the demand they have uh, you know, from their data center operator borrowers um, is another form of uh, capital relief, balance sheet relief, and bank partnerships. Um, so all of these, uh, to, a, to a broadly syndicated rated auto SRT for Santander, all of these are a form of, of, uh, of bank partnership. So um, that, I guess, to address the partnership point, how did these, how did these trades come about? Um, you spend a lot of time with banks for as a full-time job, and you discover, uh, you know, what things that they're thinking about and what their optimization plans look like, and um, you know, figuring out the the most appropriate solution. Is it, uh, you know, looking at their their non-core assets or their recently deemed non-core assets to look at them to purchase them or to uh, to execute uh, a, a simpler um, SRT transaction? It's really just listening to every bank and figuring out what they need and in what asset class. And then, you know, our team at Aries and Alternative Credit, we're across, uh, you know, our mandate is pretty broad in investing in diversified portfolios of cash flow. So that applies to 30 plus different asset classes. So the ease, um, it, it does make it, I think, easier for banks to interact with us when they know they're coming to one team to say, well, I have this issue in, um, you know, my capital call book, can we look at doing some sort of, um, you know, private capital solution where I can either sell some assets into some vehicle and you can be the equity and then we can put some sort of replenishment box around it and that will help me help me grow the business and I can still capture the economics and I can keep the borrower. Um, all of these are pretty dynamic conversations and figuring out what the bank is solving for and then creating a structure that uh, allows them to achieve uh, whatever goal it is, if it's capital relief or something else. And we've seen a broad-based, um, you know, pricing compression, if you will, within the private credit space on, um, you know, some of the asset classes. Um, Chip, I'm curious to, to get your views there on what you're seeing in terms of that. Is that also transpiring within the SRT space? 
Yeah, no, uh, you know, the recent deals uh, going back to, um, you know, the last couple of quarters have been incredibly uh, well bid. And, uh, you know, uh, one transaction in 2Q, we saw 10 to 20 times over subscription levels up and down from, you know, the AAA down to the non-rated P. So you're definitely seeing a strong appetite out there. Um, and, uh, you know, as I said, I think the low-hanging fruit for the U.S. banks to start off with is, you know, those really high RWA low loss assets that um, they can the capital markets will price efficiently, uh, but has been alluded to uh, by the others on the panel. I think it will be interesting, and I've talked with some of the banks about how, are you looking at this not just as a regulatory capital play, but can you do more originations? Are you willing to go into a non prime space uh, with a CRT, which can be easier to manage than you know having to go do a full securitization or loan sell where you can keep those economics uh, and really um, allow the you know the issuers to uh, do more um, originations for their customers and similar to you know kind of the model that you know a group o santander uh, give them credit a couple last thursday said you know they're looking to really focus on velocity of assets and velocity of capital where you know they're looking to turn their balance sheet you know a, th a third of it each year i don't think u.s banks are going to get there anytime soon but that kind of view of uh, as banks see more and more embrace of you know getting the risk outside of the banks and really optimizing the scale and the fees uh, and servicing that comes with that is um, is exciting for the market. So it sounds like the demand is there, but not necessarily on the supply side. The banks haven't really been. Um, yeah, you know. and and in fairness, I mean, I think you know you had some you know different levels. You first had you know issuers who were really wanting the capital uh, for various strategic reasons. And then you got the FAQ and you had issuers who already had pipes and infrastructures in place. Uh, and then obviously the GSIBs obviously have the, the size and uh, infrastructure in place. I think for a lot of other super regional regionals, you know, they're, they're facing other headwinds uh, between, you know, Basel III endgame, the long-term debt requirement, you know, they're being bombarded by regulators with, you know, horizontal liquidity reviews and horizontal capital, and they maybe don't have that. Uh, to build out currently, so just that focus. But uh, you know, I think over time, uh, as you see more of those super regional regionals do it, that uh, you know more will get that invest in that infrastructure and you know work whether it's a bilat or a CLM program. You know, look to put that in place and take advantage of those opportunities. And uh, <clears throat> Barry, we did have a um, a session before. I mean, this is the the whole ABF part of the ABF track, and we also had a direct lending um, session. How does SRT fit into that? Do you feel like is it is it clear cut or does, um, it, does it need? Yeah, to? I mean, I think when you look at like, I think when you look at SRT within the private credit framework. Um, I think SRT is a great way for private credit investors to um, partner with the bank rather than compete with them in their core competencies. I mean, when you look at a bank, they have um, significant market presence in significant regions and significant industries. They have long-standing client relationships. Um, they have regulatory and compliance functions. I mean, they have teams of asset managers, underwriters, all of which I think can lead to inefficiencies when deploying capital quickly, but I think it also can lead to safer lending practices. So I think as an SRT investor, you can benefit from the safer lending practices of the bank, and banks can benefit from freeing up capital and attractive costs and being able to lend more competitively in the market. So, so that actually reminded me of something that I think, Sarah, you might have touched on, and Chip as well, on the non-core versus core assets. Um, and just thinking about when a bank is doing a non-core strategy that kind of signals a disalignment of interests uh, versus when they're doing an SRT on a, on a core asset, um, you know, there's alignment, more alignment of interest. So is there, is there an argument there to actually say core versus non-core? Does that scare the investors away or how, how should we think about that? Uh, um, I think for SRT transactions, so if you think about uh, like an auto loan book, for instance, those assets are being serviced by uh, you know by that originator, that bank originator. So we're, we're going to want to hear that the 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 bank is continuing to operate in that business and service those assets and have a vested interest in the performance of those assets. So. Um, 
and, and that very much for to have an alignment of interests. So um, when it comes to, so, so the SRTs that we would do, that, that is always a question that we will ask is, uh, you know, are you, are you staying in this business? Are you continuing to originate um, so that we can align those interests? That's definitely very important to us in, in any of these transactions. Um, you know, when a, when a bank decides to sell uh, an asset because they've deemed it non-core, um, we are perfectly happy and and do execute, um, you know, on on those types of transactions as well. P perfect example being that equipment platform that we bought out of a regional bank uh, earlier this year. So, it, two two different things, I think, um, core versus non-core, and how we how we operate and and execute on those opportunities. Chip, I think you wanted to jump in when I asked that question. If you, uh, yeah, we have we have a lot of questions that just came in, so. Um, maybe we do those before we wrap up with the outlook. So a question on asset classes, and I'm assuming this is talking about the reference pools in terms of the bank loans that are being uh, underwritten and go into the SRT. Um, and given the uncertainty around bank regulation, do you see this shifting going forward? Uh, so I think the question is, what type of asset classes? So Barry. Yeah, I can talk about that. Um, I mean, I think the asset classes we've seen so far on SR, in SRT deals, Sarah mentioned, we've seen a lot of corporate loans, we've seen a lot of lever loans, we've seen a lot of cap call facilities, and we've seen auto loans. I think these have been more generic on-the-run assets, which have enabled banks to free up capital quickest and at the cheapest cost. I mean, I think going forward, banks will look to different parts of their balance sheet where the risk weight of the assets doesn't match the underlying risk, and I think those are the most attractive asset classes to put into an SRT deal, and I think that's traditionally what we've seen when you look at Europe. I mean, if you look at the European market, you see like a wide variety of asset classes backing SRT deals. And I really just think it comes down to the risk weight of the asset versus the underlying risk. Um, given the uncertainty around potential bank regulation, um, I don't know if I think bank regulation is going to increase the risk weight of assets. So I think that will make it more logical to look at different parts of your balance sheet. So. Chip. And on the second part about the uncertainty around potential new bank regulations, a couple of things I'd say on that one is, one is it's, it's pretty certain that the AOCI opt-out is not gonna be available for banks. And so not only is that an immediate hit, you're for the first time gonna have a capital um, component that's gonna be volatile. It's not, I, mean, I guess you could argue earnings at times can be volatile, but for typically for your regional, super regional banks, those earnings are gonna be predictable within a certain band and your stock buybacks and dividends, now you're gonna have to deal with that, which could lead to higher stress you know, buffer requirement. Uh, and additionally, at the end of the day, you know, ha having been both seats, uh, you know, it, to me, it's not the end game. It's it's just does this make sense as a, a prudent capital management tool to use, no matter what your requirements are. Uh, and I think uh, slowly, I, I do think it'll delay some of the uh, banks that are a little, you know, skittish or skeptical or you know, just thinking it's too complex. Uh, but as they start to embrace it and see more do that. Uh, I think that you know there'll be um, that they'll still that the same volume will come in just a matter of time. And just a clarification, AOCI opt out is talking about the fact that all banks, 100 billion and plus, will have to include unrealized losses on their available for sale securities in um, their regulatory capital calculations. The, uh, the second question was about uh, SRT's impact on credit RWAs, but what about market? Um, RWAs. Um, I'm not sure if we if we've seen any uh, technology that addresses market RWAs. It's a good question, but um, uh, I believe the answer is Chip. Uh, you want to try address that? <laughs> it's a great question, and, and that's the great thing about CRT is it is a tool that you know you can be creative with and innovative with. Um, you know, I, I, you know, there's no reason why you, uh, you can't. I'd have to, you know think a little bit more exactly how you would uh, structure that up. Uh, but, you know, short, you know, could you tranche it up, you know, to the earlier cash flows to the longers? Uh, yeah, I think that, you know, could definitely be something that could be uh, applied. And then the last one, if you want. Yeah, Sarah, please. So let me just, uh, so given the proliferation of capital and expertise in private credit um, regulations on banks, and banks becoming adverse selectors, um, originators? Um, no, I, I don't 
think so, because I think what increasing regulation on banks is doing is, is one, tightening their credit box um, and, and shifting their, their business model really more towards an originate to distribute. So it's really just a rotation um, of, of assets uh, off of their balance sheets into private credit. I don't think that that's really going to um, you know, have the banks become adversely selected in any way. Or they're actually, uh, I think, um, with that tightened credit box, uh, quite the opposite. But um, you know, private credit and, and asset-based uh, finance are becoming a bigger part of that, but just as those assets are, are shifting from the banks or, or, or the risk, you know, the first loss risk, whatever it may be, uh, shifting into to private credit. So I, I think I, I disagree with that statement slash question. <laughs> I think we had an impromptu question from the gentleman. Yeah, um, <clears throat> the banks, my sense is the banks feel a little bit better in this case, and the ministry will assume you might be as punitive as, so, it's on. Are you, are the banks maybe finding a different way to provide We've seen this in private credit where they're not they're not at the front end of the leverage, but they're on the back end of the leverage. Are you seeing that through sort of a in the SRT world or examples of that? I'm just curious how they're playing it, maybe slightly different. And I think it it depends uh, on the asset class, but certainly seeing that um, with that originate to distribute model and their preference to back lever private credit and asset asset-based finance or alternative credit players uh, is certainly certainly a trend across asset classes. But a, um, So we're, we're certainly seeing that uh, as assets are coming out of banks um, uh, into our space. Um, and then I think, you know, depending on the asset class is really where, um, you know, commercial real estate for an example. So that's certainly a place that banks are are lending, but attaching certainly at a more conservative LTV. So there's, uh, for clean assets or for higher quality assets, there's still um, demand for, uh, you know, that the kind of mezzanine capital or wedge capital or just more flexible capital to sit behind behind the banks as, uh, you know, we, we partnered with uh, with Lone Star and uh, on a recent transaction that's in the, in the press uh, on the Wembley asset. That's an example where flexible capital um, was needed. Now that one doesn't have a bank involved in it, but it's a, a similar, similar uh, theme there. So I think um, working with the banks, they definitely want to to back lever, and that is there. I think there's a, a healthy demand from the banks to be able to do that. But also there's places where we can be complementary to the banks um, in certain asset classes where they do want to lend, but they want to lend more conservatively, and there is still a demand for more flexible capital behind them uh, you know, on higher quality assets. Yeah. So with the 30 seconds each, uh, Sarah, since you have the mic just on the outlook, what do you think um, you know, stakeholders should be aware of uh, for 2025? And then we'll go down and finish it there. Sure. Um, I think from an outlook perspective on the opportunities out there in the market, we are, we're very positive. Uh, obviously, bank optimization is, is not going away. Regulation is coming. It's getting more certain, albeit less punitive than what everyone thought. But I think this, this whole um, theme of partnering with banks to help them uh, get their um, capital, their, you know, their risk-weighted assets, that optimizing that and, and their assets, that, that theme is, is here to stay. I think sector-wise... You know, there's, I don't think there's been a panel today where digital infrastructure has not been talked about and um, the need for uh, creative solutions there as well in partnership with, with banks. So um, from an outlook perspective, just purely focused on opportunity set, uh, we're very optimistic uh, for what's ahead. Barry? Um, yeah, I mean, I would generally agree. I mean, I think we'll look for increased adoption from large U.S. banks and also especially more regional banks, which I think might take more time. Um, I would say that maybe some more, we didn't really touch on this that much, but regulatory clarity, especially in SRT deals when it comes to optimal structure. Um, but I think over time, the market will develop with, in a similar way to the European market has. It just won't happen overnight. Um, and I think there's definitely a very, very big opportunity in the US when it comes to size of SRT deals. 
Yeah, and I would just say I definitely think the GSIBs are going to continue to be active. I think the super regionals that have been issuing will continue to issue. I think you'll probably see some new issuers over the next couple of quarters or two, um, you know, slowly building. Uh, but I do think at some point in the future, into 25, 26, and don't hold me to it, th th there will be an acceleration, and, and you'll start to see uh, more and more, apart from you know, something in the regulatory landscape completely changing things. Great. We are at time, so really thank you for the questions and very engaging conversations. Thank you all for your time. Thank you.